I should like this. Let's do this. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Architecture 101. This is my third video in a series about the Australian Architect registration process. Now, if you haven't seen my last two videos about um, my 10 tips for how to prepare for the registration and how the whole process works, please click on the cards above because what I'm going to talk about today is going to be difficult to understand unless you have a background in how the whole process works. So today, I'd like to run through how to prepare your application for registration and run through how to write your logbook and statement of practical experience. If you are preparing to take the next exam session, please be mindful that you need to make your application between Monday the 1st of July and Friday the 5th of July. Um, I'll include a link to the AACA page where you can make your application and also more information below. So if you haven't started preparing your logbook and statement, this is a good time to get that started before the submission. So briefly, to be eligible to take the architecture practice exam in August, you must first apply and pass part one of the registration process. To be eligible for part one, you must have one, obtained an Australian accredited qualification in architecture. So for Australian candidates, that's generally a master's degree of architecture from any of the major universities. And if you're an overseas candidate, you must first um, get your degree accredited by the AACA before you qualify. Two, complete 3,300 hours of practical experience, one year of which must be obtained after you graduated from master's, and, you can, and one year of which um, has to be local experience. Um, the two can occur separately, so that means that you can include one year of experience that you obtained overseas, and one year of experience that you obtained um, after you graduated from bachelor's or before you graduated from master's in general. Three, complete a logbook that details your 3,300 hours as per the AACA um, template. Four, complete a statement of practical experience, which is a written account of everything that's in your logbook. Five, a copy of your graduation certificate, which is certified by a qualified professional, usually a justice of peace in Australia. Six, a statutory declaration stating that all the information you've provided is truthful, and that also has to be certified by a justice of peace. And seven, the most important part, payment of the application fees. So I paid about $480 um, for part one and part two. So that includes the examination application fee um, and it just gets lumped together, you pay it once. So in today's video, I want to give you a few specific tips on how to prepare your logbook and statement of practical experience um, because it's not really clear what exactly they expect you to put into those two documents. And there is actually a way that you need to prepare them to make your process a bit easier, especially later on down the line when you do your interview. The purpose of the logbook and statement is to act as a guide for your interviewers to ask you questions about your experience. Um, this is to make sure that you do have the knowledge that you claim to have, which means that you really need to put some thought into what you put into your logbook and statement and how you present it so you don't get caught out later on in the interview. So with the logbook, you first need to download it from the AACA website. Um, I'll include a link below. And when you open it, the first thing you will see is the ID sheet page. Um, this is just information about yourself and you can easily fill that in and also include a photo. Pick a nice one. Photo. The second sheet is the criteria summary. So you do not edit this one. This is um, automatically filled in. And as you fill in your logbook, the hours will be totaled up on this page. And once you meet the qualification criteria, the box on the top right will turn green, saying that you are now eligible for part two. So it's pretty easy. If it's red, you need to put more hours in. If it's green, you're good to go. So the third, fourth, and fifth sheets are again automatically filled in, and they log the different levels of your experience um, on each project. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And the remaining sheets are your log sheets. These are the ones that you use to log your hours of experience on each project. And each sheet allows you to log about three months of experience. Um, if you work on um, large projects, you may need several sheets to catalog all of your hours um, if you worked on them for more than three months. And I prefer to, and I organize my logbook um, by project rather than chronologically because it makes it easier to edit later on. 
on each log sheet, you need to fill in the project information at the top of the page. Um, and this requires you to provide uh, specific information about the project, like the project budget, the size, um, type of construction. And this is information that you need to obtain from your supervising architect. Um, all of your experience um, must be supervised by a registered architect and you need to name them and also provide their registration number on each sheet. So generally when you're working in a large firm, um, you probably won't be working with the nominated architect um, who has a registration number. You might be working with a project leader and they may or may not be registered. That's okay. All you have to do is just not um, provide the um, firm's nominated architect's name and number, which you can just find on the ARB um, Australian Registration Board website, just Google their name, and the number should come up and you can put it in. So under the project information, you then log all of your hours against the 15 competencies, and your hours can be logged at three different levels. Executive, which means that you were the main decision-making person on the project um, for that competency, and you were basically in control of, of the project at the time. Participant, where you were a key team member on the project, but you weren't necessarily the one making the decision and you were probably taking um, instructions from a more senior person or um, a more senior registered architect. And three, observer. Um, as the name suggests, you're just observing, you're not actively participating in um, the project at the time, or you're not actively participating in that particular competency, but by observing someone who is um, the architect who is um, doing that task, you have obtained some sort of basic knowledge of how that process works. So the distinction between these three types of experience is very important because for your logbook to qualify, it has to qualify in two ways. The first way is you must log all of your experience at executive level, um, a minimum of 40 hours against each of the 15 competencies. Now, this is pretty much impossible for any young architect because to get to a, to get to a level where you're making executive decisions, you basically have to be a very experienced um, senior architect, possibly running your own firm. Um, and for some reason, whatever reason you decided you want to, uh, you didn't want to register throughout your career, and now you decided to register so you can take that first qualification. The more realistic way is to have a combination of executive, participant, and observer hours, but that um, also comes with additional criteria. You must obtain a minimum of 40 hours of experience in each of the 15 competencies. You must complete at least 40 hours of experience at executive level for at least five of the competencies. And you can only log a maximum of 160 hours against five specific competencies. And these are 1.2, establishment, analysis, and evaluation of project requirements and objectives. This is basically experience meeting the client, obtaining a brief from them, and understanding and fleshing out the project requirements. 7.1, identification of available procurement methods and assessment of relevance and application to the project. This is basically determining which consultants are required, um, how you will find a builder, how you will obtain a price and which contract to use, etc, etc. 8.3, identification and application of the process and administration systems needed to fulfill all obligations under a project contract. In essence, your experience administering a contract. 8.4, Construction progress and quality is systematically reviewed and monitored as required under contract provisions. This is going on site and checking what is being built and um, marking that against what the contract requires. And 8.5, identification and application of all relevant processes required for certification of monetary claims, et cetera, et cetera, which is processing claims, um, assessing defects, issuing certificates, um, if you are administering a building contract. If you haven't noticed already, these five competencies are particularly difficult to obtain for a young architect due to the nature of the industry. The first competency is always going to be difficult to obtain because it requires you to be involved in the initial onboarding process for a client. And if you are inexperienced or you seem incompetent or you manage to piss off the client, 
this can reflect very badly on the company and even cause them to may maybe even lose out on a major project. So it's difficult for um, large firms to entrust this kind of responsibility on inexperienced architects. For the remaining four competencies, it's not difficult to obtain these if you work for a smaller firm um, that specializes in residential architecture, because these are the majority that still do contract administration. But if you're like me and you most of your experience is working for larger firms um, that do multi-residential or commercial or basically non-residential architecture, um, you no doubt would have noticed that very few, if any of them, still do contract administration or any of those related procurement activities. This is generally now managed by a specialized project manager who manages the procurement process, um, the contract administration project, um, and project delivery. Architects rarely um, do that um, for larger projects now just because of the complexity and the amount of work involved. If you work in multi-residential architecture, you would have noticed that most of these buildings are now delivered under a design and construct contract, um, which is a special type of contract that does not require contract administration. Um, this is how most of my projects have been delivered, so I honestly have very little project um, contract administration experience. So for candidates who spent the majority of their careers working for larger firms, it is almost impossible to get experience in these four competencies. This is the reason why I believe they changed the logbook to be more flexible in the nature of the experience that you acquire. And this is part of a larger conversation about the nature of the industry at the moment. And maybe I'll make a video down the line specifically talking about this topic. Um, if you are interested, please leave a comment and I'll make that faster. So filling in the logbook is quite straightforward. You just put in the approximate amount of hours that you completed each month for each project on each sheet. And these numbers will automatically fill up in the front pages. Um, and you do not need to be extremely specific about the number of hours you completed. I did mine in factors of five and 10. So I did 10, 20, 30, 40 hours a month. And it's just a general indication of you know, how many hours you actually completed. You don't have to be extremely specific. When filling in your logbook, there are a few things that you should do. One, decide on three to four projects that you want to log hours against because at the interview, you could potentially be asked questions about any of the projects in your logbook. So you need to be 100% clear on the details of each project. Um, logging 10 projects that you worked on a, for a week or two is, not, is actually going to make you seem less competent and less experienced than if you had one or two projects that you um, know very, very well. It's really about quality, not quantity. Two, decide on which competencies you want to put your executive level hours against. Remember, you have to choose five of them to log 40 hours of executive experience. Um, if you claim to have executive experience on any of the competencies, they may press you harder um, on specific questions relating to that um, area of knowledge. And if you do not have that level of knowledge that a project architect um, or registered architect should have, or someone who was running the project should have, then it's going to, to reflect very badly on you and make them question everything that you have claimed in your logbook. So this is very important. If you do not have the experience or you are not confident about that competency, do not put executive hours against that. Three, choose one really good design project and one really good construction project. In the interview, they're going to ask you to choose an example project, um, ideally one that you were involved in from start to finish and they're going to ask you specific questions relating to each stage of that project. Now, if you do not have a project that you were involved in from um, start to finish, you can request them to ask the design related questions against a design project and ask the construction related questions against a construction project. Now, um, in your logbook, you should then load the hours, sorry, um, you should log more hours against these two projects and at higher levels, so even at an executive level, if you're comfortable with that. And that makes it more likely for them to choose these two projects um, that you are most familiar with. Four, you do not need to log all of your documentation hours. Everybody knows that when you start out as a young you know, graduate, that all you'll be doing is documentation. You, know, you might have 10,000 hours of documentation experience doing door schedules and window schedules and floor plans and stairs, 
Everyone knows that. That's not going, logging all of those hours is not going to make you any more competent or seem any more competent or knowledgeable. Um, instead, just log enough hours to meet the 3300 hour minimum requirement or even just above that and try and balance out the number of hours against each of the competencies so you don't, it doesn't seem like you are neglecting any of the parts of the knowledge because that's what the one that you log the least amount of hours against may be the one that they will pick on. Um, and it will also help you if you try and log more hours against competencies that you are more comfortable um, talking about. So if you are more comfortable talking about or if you are more of uh, more involved in the design part of a project, log more hours against the first five competencies. If you are more involved in the construction documentation um, part of projects and you're more comfortable with that, log more hours against the middle five competencies. Um, and for the last five competencies, which is con um, contract administration, I've got an, the next tip. So five, I would advise against logging any executive hours against the last five competencies that are related to contract administration, unless you are super familiar with contract administration, you've done it for years and you know all of the contracts inside out. Because um, part two, the exam and part three, the interview are heavily geared towards testing candidates' knowledge of contract administration. And they have a very high expectation of you, what um, of your knowledge of contract administration, even if you log observer hours for all of the competencies. So if you log executive hours against any of the last five, um, the one with the number eight prefix competencies, um, they're going to drill you a lot harder to make sure that you do actually have executive um, experience and you have actually um, administered a contract. And that's going to make your interview much, much harder than someone who have owned, has, um, has not logged executive hours. So my advice to you is take advantage of your choice to log observer hours against these competencies and just use all of it. Um, even if you do have a very good understanding of contract administration, there's no harm in setting the bar lower for you and then you can jump higher. Once you've completed your logbook, you're now ready to write your statement of practical experience. Now, you should only write the statement after you have completed your logbook because the statement is just a written version of what you have logged in your logbook. It is the story of how you gained your experience and is to make it easier for the interviewer to understand how, when, and where you gained your experience. So instead of me explaining the contents of the statement of practical experience, I'll include a sample of my statement um, just to help you understand the kind of content and um, formatting that I've chosen to use. Um, but there are a few things that you need to take note of when you are writing your statement. There is a 2000 word limit, so keep it short, sweet and simple. You also need to provide a CV as part of your statement. And this is where you can feel free to list all of the projects um, that you have worked on in your years of experience, um, but only provide those in list form. The written content should only be about the projects that you have logged hours against in the logbook. Your statement and your logbook needs to be consistent. The story has to be the same. If there are inconsistencies between your statement and logbook, that may flag the interviewer's attention and they will drill on that. Get rid of all of the flags. Make it easy to read. Format the page. Use colors. Highlight words. Um, highlight the parts that you want the interviewer to read because in their head, they have a checklist of all of the points that you need to hit, which are the 15 competencies. And if you make it easier for them to check off that list, they're gonna go easier on you in the interview. And finally, give real examples of how you achieved each of the competencies. This is important for two reasons. One, it makes it more believable when you include short snippets of story of how you gained each, the experience on each project rather than just stating that you have experience. So for example, I can say that on project A, I briefed the client, I engaged the consultants, and I prepared the DA. Instead of saying that, which is very generic, um, I can say something like, on project A, when I was briefing the client, they stated that they would like to have bathrooms in every single bedroom, um, but in reviewing the planning controls, I found that that would push us over the GFA, um, and I... Um, and I negotiated with them to reduce it to just two bathrooms um, instead of three. That way, 
it actually seems like it's real and you know what you're talking about. You actually told them the steps that you took um, when addressing these um, the issues that come up um, in each of the competencies. Two, you are preparing an example that you can refer back to when you do the actual interview and you are already familiar with that story. Um, this will make it seem like you are more prepared and more competent and knowledgeable and make the interview flow a lot better because you've already prepared the story beforehand. So once you have everything ready, make sure that you submit your application on time. So just to repeat, if you are um, aiming to take the next exam session, you must make your application between Monday the 1st of July and Friday the 5th of July. Prepare everything ahead of time. Um, have someone read it, edit it, reread it. Um, I'll include links to everything um, in the description box below um, and also links to um, for you to download an example of my own logbook and my own statement. Um, if you need someone to read it, I'm happy to read it. So you can, um, I'll include my email below and you can email that to me and I'll try and get comments back to you as soon as possible. I've also gone over a few points about the interview process, um, but be sure that I'm going to make a specific video about the interview closer to um, the next interview date. Um, and I'll go through everything that you need to prepare and um, you need to know about the interview. So after this video, I'm gonna move on and start talking about the actual content that can be tested in the practical exam. Um, there is a lot of content, so to make it faster um, and easier for me to produce the content, I'm going to be releasing a podcast with every video. Um, the podcast will go into detail into every, every one of the topics, but the videos will just be me clarifying specific points in, um, on a topic, or if there's a visual diagram that I think would be helpful um, in explaining the topic better, I'm gonna make a video about that. But if you want the full explanation, um, just follow the podcast, I'll include um, a link in each of the videos. So I'm planning on releasing my study notes as well, um, and hopefully that will help you reduce the amount of content that you need to read and help you study faster and more efficiently. So stay tuned, there's a lot happening, and I'll um, release more information in my next video. Thank you for your support.